This week on Quality Digest Live, we chat with K.R. Carew of Sparta Systems about the ongoing evolution of quality tools. Plus, um, is the FDA opening Pandora's box when it comes to medical device data systems? We'll find out when we come back. Today's sponsor of Quality Digest Live is Hexagon Metrology. Hexagon carries the widest range of quality brands. With an extensive support network, Hexagon is also your partner. Hexagon Metrology. We are Metrology. Welcome back to Quality Digest Live for August 8th, 2014. QDL is your weekly look at who and what is making the news in the world of quality. I'm Mike Richmond, publisher of Quality Digest. That you are. And I'm Quality Digest Editor-in-Chief. Dirk Ducharme. That you are. That I am. Several months ago, we reported on the Critical Materials Institute, CMI, led by Ames Laboratory in Ames, Iowa. This was the, uh, the latest of the U.S. Department of Energy's five innovation hubs, uh, whose goal really is to accelerate scientific discovery in critical energy areas. Uh, at the time, that was about a year ago, it was awarded up to $120 million over five years, and we're one year into that. Its initial focus was on developing solutions to shortages for five rare earth elements as well as lithium and tellurium and the technologies that use these uh, critical materials. So we're talking things like electric vehicle motors and batteries, uh, wind turbines, energy efficient lighting, thin film solar cells and the like. So essentially what we're talking about here is a supply issue. As, we, as these alternative, uh, uh, alternative energy uses uh, grow. Uh, many of them use rare earth materials and supply is, is an issue. So the, the goal was to kind of deal with that. So their uh, one year anniversary has passed and apparently the guys over there names are doing uh, great work. Uh, they have already released 11 invention disclosures. The inventions mostly improved extractive processes, recycling techniques and substitute materials. Uh, technologies designed to increase the production and efficiency of uh, and actually reduce reliance on the use of rare earth materials and other critical materials. So 11 inventions in one year is a pretty fast pace. And as CMI director Alex Keane pointed out, quote, given that it usually takes about 20 years to commercialize new material technologies, we are going to be setting some records mm. with CMI. So basically this was, this whole, the goal of this whole thing was to kind of fast track this and kind of not have to take 20 years to get new materials into the market, particularly when we've got alternative, uh, alternative energy sources and our t alternative energy equipment that is ramping up very quickly. Mm -hmm. That kind of pace, 20 years, uh, is just too long. So mm -hmm. the goal was to kind of fast track that. Right. And it looks like they're, uh, they're on their way. Yeah, good job. Good job there by, by Ames uh, and the CMI. Yep. Ex excellent work there. Okay. Also in the news this week, the British Assessment Bureau recently surveyed its client base and the results of that survey revealed some interesting and some good news about the benefits of ISO 9001. Bearing in mind that respondents could identify more than one benefit of the standard, far and away the top benefit reported by 55% of the survey companies was on internal improvement. It's revealing that only 31% of respondents pursued ISO 9001 certification for that specific reason. The vast majority of companies in the survey began looking into ISO 9001 to win business or satisfy customers. And although many reported that the standard did indeed help them achieve those goals, it's clear that the biggest benefits came from the enterprise-wide improvement and efficiencies. Interesting. Yeah. People who they surveyed said so they got into it because customers wanted it. It's marketing reasons. Which sales is pre pretty whatever. typical. Yep. Pretty typical. Yep. But what they found when they really got into it and they did it was that the true benefit was improving the organization, right? I mean, it doesn't hurt. Uh, in terms of, of, of having customers and, and reaching out to customers that you're ISO 9001 certified. But really the benefit, as they say, is, is the improvement. And, and I think what would be interesting to know is this is obviously based on the latest version of uh, ISO 9001. The current, the current one. The yes. current one, uh -huh. yeah. Um, I'm not sure those numbers would have been the same if they had done this back with kind of the original, yeah. the first couple of iterations of ISO 9001, which a lot of people just felt like, you know, I'm, I'm doing it because my customers want yeah. me to have this, and I, I'm not seeing any internal internal benefit. I think the latest version actually did really kind of tip the scales into actually, wow, there's some real benefit in this stuff. And, and it's moving even more that way and even more here it, yeah. in the 2015 version. Now, yeah. uh, what, what they're saying, what the BAB is saying here reflects a trend that they're, they're seeing in the UK 
just as we're seeing here in the U.S., there's, there's two camps of ISO 9001 proponents. The first are those uh, that see the standard as a sales and marketing tool, like a checkbox, mm -hmm. if you will, right? The second sees ISO 9001 as a driver of overall organizational uh, excellence. We believe, and I think the authors of this report share our belief, that the best course is to blend both an outward as well as an inward focus when considering the benefits of the standard. ISO 9001, I, I think without a question, is, is a great tool to assure prospective customers uh, of your company's commitment to quality and continuous improvement, but it only works if you actually use it to continuously improve your quality and the outputs you deliver to those customers. Right. And it's kind of one of those chicken and egg kind of things, but you really do need both, I think, to get the maximum benefit and results from ISO 9001. So, for more information on this uh, news item and, in fact, all the stories that Dirk and I are going to be covering on the show, be sure to, as always, check out the story links right below the video player screen right down there. There you go. Okay, well, as you know, if you've been watching us for a while or if you read Quality Digest quite a bit, mm -hmm. uh, we have discussed and will continue to dis discuss the importance of having a single source or single repository uh, of data, uh, getting rid of uh, the information silos, quotes, information silos, uh, having a single system handle the data instead of duplicating data in multiple systems allows shared data to reside in one system and still be consumed by others that may need it. And this is really a, a part of what an enterprise quality management system is all about. Well, today's guest is K.R. Carew from Sparta Systems, and he is going to describe what this might look like on a practical level. So what you might be doing now versus the way things could work at your company and the value it could bring to you. Uh, good morning, KR. Hi, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you're watching from. <laughs> there here, you go. Here. So let's get right into this. In, in the past, we've kind of talked, um, I don't know, just kind of in general, you know, what does this software look like, so on and so forth. But we haven't really gotten into a lot of detail of what does this look like for the, for the end user. I mean, in the article uh, that you wrote uh, this week for us, um, you give an example of bottles breaking on a manufacturing floor. So describe, if, if, if you don't mind, in a little bit more detail, what might have happened pre-enterprise quality management software and what could happen with uh, EQMS? Sure. Uh, a couple of stages. If you take that example of bottles breaking, uh, a piece of equipment that might be filling liquids into bottles uh, might be chipping the bottles. So uh, in, in the past, they might have fixed it, uh, run it again, had this problem recur a week later, fix it, do those type of things. Uh, with, with a quality management system, not even enterprise-wide, maybe they start recording that and they find that uh, uh, you know, we're filling 200 bottles a minute, and when we slow it down to 190, it doesn't chip it anymore. So now with an enterprise quality management system, when they determine the root cause and the repair, they can, if, if a company has multiple sites manufacturing things, they can go into uh, their other systems, see exactly where they're using the same piece of equipment, and apply the fix before it happens elsewhere. So in this way, they're reducing quality events uh, that may be happening in the future, other places, find it one place, fix it every place. And, and by, fix it, by fix it every place, um, are you saying because uh, uh, multiple sites might have access to the same, uh, I don't know, uh, corrective action, kind of process? I mean, is, is, that what, is that what we're saying here, where this, this data would be available to everybody to see how a, a particular problem was fixed? Exactly. Uh, and and a, a lot of the leading companies are really proactive. So they've integrated their, their, their uh, uh, enterprise resource planning systems, which might have an inventory of systems, inventory of, of raw materials used. So when a problem is found at one site uh, and corrected, uh, the, the uh, corporate quality folks go in or, or drive um, uh, preventive actions at locations where the same problem may occur. So uh, again, find it one place, fix it every place. Now, uh, contrast this, I mean, we, we're talking a little bit about CAPA here, cor uh, corrective action and, and preventive action. How might that work in let's say, a, a, a kind of a pencil and paper world, or, or it, let's say at least a company where, where information is kind of siloed. Contrast what you just described to maybe what a lot of people are doing right now. 
Sure. Uh, what what actually in most companies uh, at the plant level they're independent, even though they're making the same product, uh, and so they they solve problems independently. They do not communicate those issues, or if they do, it's it's through um, uh, spreadsheets and reports that might come out months and months and months later. Now. It, we're, we're actually taking it a few steps further because, you know, there are those leading companies that have put in enterprise systems that everyone has visibility to issues. So if someone has a problem, uh, same problem, uh, the, the fill machine is breaking vials, uh, they can query the global system and see if someone else has had the problem and how they solved it. Um, but you know one of the realities of of what goes on in companies is that even with these systems in place how do they how do they currently do it um, this is happening on on a production floor uh, somebody takes notes and maybe sometime later someone goes sits down at a laptop and actually enters it into a system so there can be a delay or a lag of 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 um minutes, hours, sometimes even days of, of an event being put into the system by the people who are witnessing it and have quality begin their investigation to determine, you know, what to do about it. Is this a, is this a systemic problem or something like that? So, you know, what we want to talk about is adding everyday technologies. All of us are walking around with smartphones in our pockets. Uh, I, I, I can't walk through an airport without uh, someone running me down because they're checking their, uh, their, their emails while they're rushing between planes. Well, think about the people on the production line. As, as these bottles are being broken or, or, or being cracked, uh, they can pull out their phone, they can log into the system with, with a few quick keystrokes. Here's what we we're making, here's the equipment that we we're using. Uh, here's who was involved in it, and, and even, you know, use the camera on it to take a picture of it and send it to quality immediately so the investigation can start as, as the issue is happening, not a day or a week later. Uh, that goes back to Deming, who, you know, long ago said uh, you have to build quality into the process, and if you, if you solve a problem while you're making something, it usually adds a factor of 1x. If you find the problem after you complete manufacturing, it costs you 10 times as much. If you find it after it gets out in the market, it's 100 times or more to fix it. So exactly. the idea is, is to start the quality investigations as the events are happening, not look at them uh, after the fact. KR, now you, 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 this really gets to the heart of what you're talking about here because you're talking about all that data and connecting the dots with all that data that you're collecting and, and then uh, you know, having that analytics uh, and what you can do with the analytics. So give us an example. Give us a hypothetical of, of you know, how you collect that data and what you do with the data once it's collected. Great. Um, again, people have silos of systems around quality and, 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 and let's take this same example um, that, that, you know, vials or bottles were being broken in you know during the manufacturing and it was because they were going through the machine too fast or, or what, whatever the root cause is uh, now you have other systems in place including complaint systems and I'll, I'll, I'll take something uh, from an article I read uh, yesterday um, a, a pharmaceutical company had a third recall of, of products and they're holding over six million dollars worth of, of their their inventory because there are glass particulates uh, in the solution. Now, um, doesn't take too much to connect those dots that maybe those uh, uh, broken pieces were from when they were going through the machine and, and it was breaking the glass and it was making its way in there. So, so now, now you have complaints, you have um, batches, you have problems going on. Uh, during manufacturing, maybe even your auditors discovered of an audit of the equipment manufacturer that they had new specifications for, you know, avoiding breakage. So all of these things are in silos, and, and unless 
you're able to look across the board and, and, and find those things. This is a way of, of, of finding issues and doing things. And as you, as you collect um, quality data, uh, analytics is an amazing thing. There, there are algorithms out there that allow you to do now predictive analytics. So if you are analyzing your quality data, you can actually start to predict where your problems are going to be and correct them before they actually happen. And that's, that's the goal where everyone wants to get that, you know, you're going you're gonna to know where those, those problems are going to occur and be able to keep an eye on those things and, and catch them early, not when they get out into the marketplace. Exactly, and we're going to actually, uh, uh, KR, uh, you and me will actually be presenting a Quality Digest webinar on this topic, uh, kind of the, the practicalities of uh, quality management systems. Um, on uh, Tuesday, August 12th at 2 p.m., we see the slide up there, uh, 11 a.m. Pacific, uh, 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, there is a link actually at the bottom of the story uh, that you can use to, I'm sorry, underneath the player page, uh, underneath the story that you can use to register the, uh, for the event. So if you're interested in the technology of quality, just go ahead and underneath our player page, there's a link, click that, and that will let you register for this webinar. So uh, KR, thanks for joining us this morning. Mike, Dirk, always a pleasure. Okay, thanks. See you okay. later, man. Thanks, okay. KR. Bye. Yes, and you'll see, we'll see KR a lot more on Tuesday, on get Tuesday. into it yep. a lot deeper. Good, good topic, a lot of interesting uh, nuggets there for people who are really in, in anywhere in quality, you won't really need to know about, about this and breaking down the silos. Good, exactly. Good stuff, okay. Uh, another good article we covered this week actually came from, uh, from Russ King, and he talks about the FDA, and, and Kara was just talking about the FDA a little bit there as well. And the name of this article is, uh, Time to Take a Closer Look at FDA MDDS Moves by Russ King, there it is. It appeared in Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. So what he's talking about here is the FDA's recent draft guidance document for medical device data systems, MDDS. Uh, and these are products, either software or hardware, that transfer, store, or otherwise provide access to information gleaned from medical devices. Makes sense. Now, according to the guidance document, the FDA will not be enforcing regulatory controls over these devices because the use, or, or really in, in, at, at worst, the misuse of these items poses a very low risk to the public. So what they're saying is, is we're not going to really you know, implement the controls because these devices really can't, can't really hurt anybody. So you know, there's not a lot of risk involved here. Uh, so we're not going to really worry about it that much. Now, note, it's important to note here, I think, that an MDDS doesn't uh, modify data uh, and these systems are not to be used for patient monitoring and or diagnoses. King argues, however, that it's likely that they will be used for exactly that purpose, uh, which is in part the problem. He's saying, you know, sure, you say to a doctor or, or a nurse, you don't use this for diagnoses, right? But, you know, if it's useful for that, they're going to find a tool. way. Yeah, yeah it's yeah. kind of off-label, but they're going to do it, right? I mean, that's just the way it works many times. So that's part of the problem, but it's not really the central issue that King addresses. The central issue here, in King's mind, is data integrity, one of data integrity. He does not trust that these applications, these apps, can be created bug-free, which would therefore maybe compromise the data in some way. So what he's saying is that, you know, software development apps are buggy, you know, right. that, 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 you know, uh, there's a lot of, of, of protocols put in place to protect data, patient data, right? And, and who knows if this data is gonna be, the integrity of the data is gonna be taken correctly, and if it's going to be protected properly, you know, with these software applications, that's his key concern. Um, the other side of this is the belief that bugs aside, the general sweep of, of FDA guidance on this topic, and, and in recent times, has been more towards a risk-based framework, uh, which allows innovation and ultimately benefits patients and doctors more than that control. And, and you know, this is really a classic debate in the world of technology. We've seen it in, in all sorts of areas sure. of technology, this idea that, you know, some want to really push the boundaries and others want to push the boundaries, but also want to be mindful of what maybe is being messed up or, or at risk when you make those advancements. And the Internet of Things, which just really is a part of that whole idea, using these devices to, to, to connect and communicate, has thrown all that really into sharper relief as industrial settings as well as medical uh, settings, uh, you know, allow you to do that. So the question is, just because you can do something, should you? And, and what does a regulatory body like the FDA do to control or allow that? How do you balance the, the, the needs and the desire to innovate and to have practical tools that people can use that help patients with the 
problem of protecting their data and their information and not you know having it work properly. That, that's an interesting well, balance I, and, there. I, and I think there's another. I think there's another. Uh, I think there's another issue here as well, which is. The FDA's already got a lot on its plate, uh -huh. and we already know that they're shorthanded. So if now, along with monitoring drugs, monitoring uh, 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 medical devices that are you know, uh, implanted medical devices, uh, invasive medical devices, if they have to monitor all that, and food, and everything sure. else that they're doing, and now we're going to throw on top of that, oh yeah, now by the way you have to go out and audit uh, all, this, all these jillions of, and, Trust me, there will be trillions. Ten, ten billion, I think, was the number yeah. quoted in this article. Uh, of of yeah. software, uh, software devices coming yeah. out there that are have really low risk. Do you really want the FDA shifting their emphasis and delaying the release of drugs, delaying the release of medical devices, yeah. delaying the the release of stuff that is really life saving in order to, on the off chance yeah. that they may be protecting you from a software bug that yeah. does something that you don't like when the risk is fairly low. I, I, I really think a lot of it comes down to the FDA as a, as a manpower issue. Yeah, it's, an F, it's also a failure modes and effect analysis thing. On right. the scale of an FMEA, you know, this type of a failure would be a lot lower than a medical device failure. Right. So again, using a risk-based fr uh, framework, which the FDA is doing here, they're deciding it's not really that high of a priority. And, and King has taken the task a little bit. Others have been kind of supportive of that. Um, it's just an interesting debate. I think that it's one that we should be aware of, especially if you're in that industry. Uh, so check out the article, good article there by Russ. Russ King appeared in uh, Wednesday's issue of Quality Digest Daily. You can read it right down there. There we go. Okay, well, recently we attended uh, Hexagon's big use, Hexagon's, uh, Hexagon's the big, uh, well, we know them as Hexagon Metrology. That's the area of them yeah. that we work with, but the Hexagon actually covers many other uh, technology as, as well. But they had a big user event in uh, Las Vegas. And while we were there, we got a chance to set, uh, check out some of the new equipment from uh, Hexagon Metrology and uh, some software as well that are coming down the pike from the company. So over the next three weeks, we will be taking a look at some of this existing and to be announced equipment. Uh, and uh, stepping us through it uh, while we were there was Lester Glover, Vice President of Key Account Business Development for Hexagon Metrology. He walked us through the equipment at the show. And um, the first couple of products that we're going to see here haven't actually been released yet. Hexagon's hub software and, uh, get this, a Google Glass PC Demus interface. So if you guys use PC Demus, there is a potentially a Google Glass um, interface coming out. Uh, that will interface with uh, the PC Demos if you're, if you're using that. I think I said that now three times. Okay, so let's take a look at this video. And welcome to the Metrology Zone here at Hexagon Live 2014 in Las Vegas, Nevada. I'm Dirk Ducharme, Editor-in-Chief of Quality Digest. And with me today also is Lester Glover, Vice President, Key Account Business Development for Hexagon Metrology. Lester, thanks for letting us come into your booth. Dirk, welcome to Las Vegas. Welcome <laughs> to Hexagon Metrology. Yeah, it's pretty hot here today, I'll tell yeah, you. Yeah, it is. <laughs> it's cooler inside. Well, what are we, what are we going to be doing today? Uh, we're going to be looking at some exciting new products and technologies that we brought with us this year. Uh, that are being debuted here at uh, Hexagon Live 2014. And some, some brand new products, right? Yes, brand okay. new. Okay, terrific. Looking forward to seeing them. Good, let's get started. Uh, okay, Lester, so the first product we're going to look at here is Hub, right? Correct. Okay. And I reckon this, it's connected to this. I recognize this machine. We, this yeah. is one of your original, uh, your original shop floor, That's right? That's right, Dirk. Okay. You were in Quonset Point where this machine is built. Um, for the introduction of the 454, I believe, a couple of years ago. Okay. So the 454 SF was the first in the line of our shop floor machines. We're going to look at the larger one here in just a little bit. But the thing we want to show you here is called Hub. Hub is a monitoring system that basically uh, monitors all of the uh, environmental conditions of the machine. As you know, we put a machine on the shop floor. We're very concerned about things like vibration, temperature, and humidity. So you have, if you notice on the machine itself, on the ZRAM in here, you have accelerometers, and then you also have temperature sensors. And so in real time, you're able to monitor all of these uh, parameters, temperature, we can look at vibration over time, we can look at temperature over time, humidity as well. But the most interesting thing about being able to monitor each machine is that that's going to tie back to our MMS, our metrology management system. As well, I can actually have, upon a crash or an event, I can actually have it notify my cell phone. So if I'm in a large network of a bunch of machines, I can 
monitor the uptime and utilization of my machines with notifications to me when an event occurs. So, so what we're looking for here is actually events. So, so, so something that may have affected the uh, the operation of the or the measurement of, of the machine. I mean, we're not looking just for in general. Oh, has the temperature floated around? Because the the machine's going to compensate for temperature variation anyway, well, right? Well, correct. We want to tie everything back to measurement results. So okay. when we see an anomaly in measurement results, we want to tie it back to potentially an event uh, that occurred in the environment with the machine. Okay. And then, as you mentioned, most importantly is I want to look at the utilization of the machine, which is its uptime. Uh, over a shift or a period of time. Now this is, uh, this seems to be tied into um, uh, the keynote yesterday. You guys were talking about the Internet of Things and how exactly. you guys are integrating Internet of Things into your equipment. This is actually an example of exactly. that, right? Exactly. Okay. It's one of many uh, examples that we'll see on our tour of uh, user experience and, and the Internet of Things. So you're exactly right. We, we uh, have a number of ideas that are evolving that just basically give the machine a better user experience, and this is one of them. And you mentioned uh, that it can send alerts. I'm assuming that you can set up parameters for each of these. Only send me alert if my temperature goes above That's or below correct. vibration. That's correct. So far. I have okay. a I have a uh, threshold of temperature range, humidity and of course vibration that again could cause an anomaly in the measurement results. And uh, I'm assuming somebody could also get on the internet uh, investigate, uh, look into the machine and see what it's doing currently, or is it strictly a push? No, it's absolutely, uh, as you also heard, uh, a collection in a database of data that can be distributed uh, as needed. Okay, now, um, I noticed that we've got up here one, two, three, four, so it can monitor up, what, four machines at a time? Uh, it can actually monitor more than that. Okay. Um, it's just set up right now, as you see on the screen, to monitor uh, four. And. Uh, you may be getting to this um, maybe in another segment that we're going to do, but uh, Hubs tied, ties into something that... Um, Metrology uh, Management System. Yeah, the MMS is yeah. what you call and, it, right? And okay. MMS is something that uh, we're real excited about. And uh, so utilization of the machine, uptime, and the real-time conditions of the machine is one of the many things that we'll look at when we look at the MMS uh, dashboards. Okay. Um, anything else we should see on this? No, I think that's about it. Okay. We've got a metrology nerd here. Uh, what, are we, <laughs> what are we looking at now, Lester? So we're going to show you the newest, coolest interface. Everybody's familiar with Google Glass. So this is actually going to be a useful? Uh, Absolutely. We use found for a, Google Glass? We found okay. a good <laughs> tool for you, Google Glass. Other than just like scoping people out in bars? Okay. That, that's, right. that's right. Okay. That's right. right. This one is totally legal. And uh, <laughs> it involves my colleague here. He's tethered to Google Glass only so that we can see what he's seeing. But okay. obviously, normal, it would be completely hands-free operation. So the beauty of it is that when you use a manual device, you would ultimately like to have both your hands free. Okay. And you don't want to go back and forth between the laptop and the device or the part that you're measuring. Okay. So he can just focus on what he's doing. The other nice thing is that it interfaces very well with PC Demos because PC Demos has feature recognition. So automatically, when he measures more than three points, PC Demos knows it's a plane. Okay. When he measures two points, PC Demos knows it's a line. Three points, a circle, so forth and so on. So he's really not having to interface or cue any measurement routine up. It's just automatically recognizing the features as he measures, and then he's able to then basically measure all his points, create all his features, and then he can park his glasses and he can create his, uh, his inspection report from Okay, there. so I'm, I'm not all that familiar with, with Google Glass. I mean, is, is this used only strictly for visual feedback for him to see what he's doing, or is, can he do some sort of control through the glass as well? I mean... Well, again, with a manual device, uh, he basically is the controller. Okay, so, he, so he's, he's, he's controlling using the arm That's itself, right, say, that's okay. right, that's okay. right. And then he can, you look at, uh, he can look at his features and he can look at his report. Uh, through the glass, but the main thing is just to be as efficient as humanly possible in the creation of the features that are being measured. Okay, and he's uh, right now he's using it with an arm and PC Demos. Could it be used with uh, something else besides the arm, like a tracker? A tracker? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, it's ideal for any manual device. It okay. really is. So then he would have uh, if he was yeah. I mean, for, so for instance, with a tracker, 
uh, which obviously very very often you're a fair wet distance away from the uh, from the tracker itself. Right. So this actually allows it to work at a distance without having to worry about the laptop and, that's and right. going back and that's forth. That's right. And so I forth. mean, we've okay. we've interfaced to iPads, and that's really handy. Um, but the Google Glass is just another evolution in an interface where again I don't have to go back and forth. Yeah, I can see everything I need to see while I'm measuring the part. Okay. And what was, um, if you don't mind my asking, what was the what was the motivation for that? I mean, were you getting feedback from customers that you know we need some sort of way to have hands-free operation and well, say, hey, there's Google Glass. Let's not, not really. As you as you've heard here at Hexagon 2014, there's a big push toward the user experience okay. uh, and efficiency. And uh, Google Glass is a cool tool that came out that we all see and look at and recognized and someone on our product development team said hey that's probably a good idea for the arm and here we are okay uh, b by the way as we said um, uh, as I said at the top here uh, the hub the first uh, product that you saw that the hub software uh, hasn't been released yet uh, it's still in development and I'm not sure actually the Google Glass PC Demos interface has been uh, released yet either um, but if you are interested in either one of those uh, why don't you email us at QDL at qualitydigest.com and we will hook you up with somebody at Hexagon who can tell you more about it. That's right. <clears throat> well, thank you there to Hexagon and that is our show for the week and before we go, we'd like to offer another thanks to Hexagon who is today's sponsor of the show. Hexagon Metrology is committed to helping you control your processes, enhance the quality of your products and increase efficiencies. They empower you to stay one step ahead of a changing world with their wide range of product offerings, nearly 200 years of expertise and an extensive support network. Hexagon Metrology, where quality comes together. For more information, just click on the banner edge just below or just to the right of this video player screen. That's right. And remember, uh, KR Crew and myself mm -hmm. will be presenting a Quality Digest webinar on Enterprise Quality Management System software on Tuesday, August 12th at 2 p.m. Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. There is a link uh, underneath the player page down there that you can use to register for the event. That's right. So check that out. Make sure you sign up for it, and we'll, we'll see you on Tuesday for that webinar. And we'll see you next week for another great week of Quality Digest Daily, and next Friday here by myself. Derek, you're not going to be right. here. That's right. I'm taking a vacation. But please all join me, because I'll be here by myself for Quality Digest Keep Live next Friday. So we'll see you then. So long. Bye.